I'm Janet Forrest, and this is The Bonds, The Mitchells, and The Dawn of Time. Episode 6. We began this season with William Mitchell and William Bond, who were among a small group of people in the pursuit of precise time, in an era where most people didn't care or didn't understand its importance. We conclude our story with Mariah Mitchell and Sarah Bond, in a new era, when the world has been transformed by the work of these two families, and we're now reliant on astronomy, engineering, and surveying. If we reflect back on what it was like in the mid-1800s and the societal views on gender roles, it's rather remarkable that the legacies of the Bonds and the Mitchells would be carried forward by two women. Surely, by today's standards, this would not seem exceptional. Or would it? In this final episode of this season, Jason Leonardo Finger of the Mariah Mitchell Association and Jim Borzilleri of the Nantucket Athenaeum talk about how Mariah and Sarah navigated and overcame the expectations of their time. They also talk about the lasting impact their careers had and contemplate on what has changed and what is not. The first social norm we tackle is marriage. The choice to marry or not, and what liberties and aspirations a woman might be sacrificing if she does marry. In Sarah's case, marriage thrust her into a career she never would have pursued on her own. Mariah, on the other hand, chose not to marry, partly because she feared it would impact her career. And Mariah had many close examples to suggest that would be the case. Here's Jason. Mariah's sisters all basically had jobs before they got married and quickly didn't have jobs after they got married, not because their husband's weren't supportive of them because they're, they were all members of the Association for the Advancement of Women, which Mariah helped to found and was the president of. But Mariah did say that she actually, with a large family in particular, she wound up taking care of both of her parents. So she took care of her mother and then she would take care of her father and her father actually lived with her. They moved to Lynn after her mother passed away in 1861 and then they moved to Vassar together where he died in 1869. But she always said that she had so many nieces and nephews, you know, the, the family considering it was nine children who lived adulthood, which is a large family, they were very close. And she always said she was always surrounded by love. So she never felt that she was lacking. Although she would early in her life make, you know, in, you know, in her twenties make comments about being lonely. But I think in some respects, she made a conscious choice. But again, I go back to that little inkling of, was there something between George Bond and Mariah, which I was taught, you know, having kind of grown up at the MMA, that story was always there in the background. But if Mariah had ever made any comments in her journals, she left all her journals and papers to her sister, Phoebe, and Phoebe was very, very good at editing, whether it was blading out pages or gluing pages together, or she had this remarkable kind of cross hatching that she did with a fountain pen. And it was, it, you can't read anything through it. It's worth mentioning that Mariah felt free to make this choice because of the setting in which she was raised. If she had gotten married like her sisters, it's not a foregone conclusion that she would have stopped working. And I think it also depends on the situation. You know, if she marries and she hasn't worked before and then her husband turns out to not be the best at work and bringing home <laughs> funds to support the family or because she becomes a, a widow or what have you. But on Nantucket also, Mariah grew up in that kind of unique environment in which, you know, women were supported in working and women were supported in the fact that they didn't have to marry. They weren't considered a burden. And a lot of that is kind of that Quaker belief in the equality of the sexes, but also just the nature of what Nantucket was like at that point with so many men going off whaling. You know, women were really running the economy and keeping things afloat. Another tricky balance Sarah and Mariah kept was when and where to take credit. In episode two, we cover the hoops Mariah needed to jump through and the team of advocates it took to ensure she was properly awarded her gold medal for discovering the comet. She had a community of support behind her that encouraged her to take the credit that was due to her. Sarah found it a bit harder 
to thread the needle between taking credit and bending to social expectations. She would write a paper in 1875 where she says, my role was simply as bookkeeper and ciphering of the chronometers. But I think that's a bit disingenuous. Why was it so important to her to not take credit? Well, she was born in 1835. She was the daughter of a minister. One thing that clearly runs through entire life is her deep, deep and sincere religious faith. She was working on several church committees throughout all of this. So this is someone who I think had a very strong sense of humility. Like many women of her era, she certainly wasn't about to publicly display what she's doing. She wasn't on an ego trip. Although in that paper in 1875, she does make allusion to the fact that she was a little concerned about publicly assuming control of the business, but discovered that it actually worked out that there were no, you know, there were no negative consequences. Given the attitudes at the time, a firm that's run by a woman, you know, that's, that's going to raise some eyebrows. But she was clearly perceived as competent by the people who cared. The fact that either of them received credit for their contributions was in itself remarkable, as so many others did their work in the shadows. There are other women who were astronomers, but they had to give the credit to their brothers or their fathers. Caroline Herschel is a prime example of that. She took, was able to take some credit later, but a lot of the work she did, she gave did her credit had to go to her brother, William Herschel, because it was unacceptable. She was a generation earlier than Mariah. She's basically like William Mitchell's generation. And it was unacceptable. And they were, they were English. They were in, in, in England. Unacceptable that a woman would be doing those kinds of things. Mariah would meet Caroline's nephew, John, on her first trip to Europe in the 1850s. And he gave the lady astronomer an unexpected souvenir. He t- opened one of Caroline Herschel's notebooks and ripped out a page, much to Mariah's horror, and gave it to her as a memento. She would carry on a lifelong friendship with them. And also, finally, after you know 20 or 30 years, paste that piece of Caroline Herschel's notebook into her own journal because the paper had slowly crumbled down to nothing and she was afraid that nothing would survive if she didn't do that. It was a hard pill to swallow, but for women like Caroline Herschel and so many others, it was a trade-off they were willing to make. They went unrecognized if it meant they could keep doing the work. And though Sarah and Mariah were given recognition, it wasn't something they basked in. They had more important priorities. For Sarah, her focus was keeping the business viable until her son Willie could take over. For Mariah, it was more about making sure every avenue was open equally to men and women. Mariah wanted to create a system where each generation elevated the next generation. I think she understood where she fit into the network and I think she appreciated that she had mentors. All of these people took an interest and helped her. They saw her ability. If she were here, she would be doing what she did almost at the end of her time at Vassar, where she was saying, I have trained all these people. They are as good as any man can be educated. Mm -hmm. They now have the same level of education. Where are the astronomers after me? When Mary Whitney, her former student, took over at Vassar, before she was officially made head of astronomy and head of the observatory, she said, something you would hope that all mentors would say, that I hope that she surpasses me. I think Mariah had mixed feelings about awards and mixed feelings about putting people up onto pedestals and didn't want that for herself. I would think that she would be pleased in the Mariah Mitchell Women of Science Symposium, but I could also see where she might not want her name on it. Not because I don't want to be associated with that, but it's just more about, you know, Mariah said to her students, we are women studying together. And that's the whole point of the symposium too, you know, working together from a 20-year-old student to a 75-year-old former astronomer, botanist, or whatever, everybody working on the same field to try and make everything better for everyone else. And that whole idea of putting your hand back to help those behind you. Because Mariah knew that she was standing on the shoulders of many people. It absolutely makes sense to me why people don't know who the Mitchells are, because they were too busy thinking about three generations ahead and just focusing on the work. They needed a publicist. (laughs) <laughs> they also were Quaker and I think that played a role in that kind of kind of quietness and not boasting but no they were they were working they were diligent about what they were doing and they were trying to help other people and they didn't take credit for it there's a lot of people who tooted their own horns quite a bit <laughs> heavily mm, 
sorry, Jim, men who <laughs> tooted their horns quite a bit because the women couldn't, number one, because if they did, then they would get in trouble because they were working outside, you know, their sphere. Yeah, they needed a publicist. They needed to be more, maybe more loud about what they were doing, but at the same time, would they, if they had been loud, would they have one been the same people? Would they have been able to accomplish some of the things that they did that they kind of, like I said with Mariah and originally working for the Coast Survey, kind of flying under the radar and nobody knowing that she's there. Mariah became a loud and proud advocate for women in science at Vassar and beyond. In a much quieter, more subtle way, Sarah was also working for the cause of other women. Let's revisit what she had to say at the third conference for women in 1875, which was presided over by none other than Mariah Mitchell. There is one point concerning my entrance into this business that I think might really be of some use, even to those who may never, like me, be thrown upon their own resources. That is, that I could not have done it without previous training, not only in mathematical, but mechanical, which training I went through from choice when there was no reason to apprehend that I should ever be obliged to put it to practical use simply from the desire to understand and share my husband's pursuits. When I knew the necessity, it would have been too late to acquire it. While during my whole married life, my acquaintance with the details of the business enabled me to judge when I might spend freely and when and why I should save, thus sparing us a fertile source of trouble and discord. Though her husband Richard did everything possible to prepare Sarah to take over Bond and Sons, once he passed away, it was her decision, along with her brother John, on how to run the firm. I think there's a lot of Richard's guidance in how the business was conducted in the remaining years. You know, Richard was not afraid to take on debt. And I don't think the decisions that Sarah and her brother made would have been any different from the ones that Richard would have done under the same circumstances. He might have done it sooner and he might have taken on even more debt. We don't know. She was a single woman in a man's world raising three kids. She might not have felt as comfortable taking a risk the way Richard was. Well, there is one document, again, in the Harvard archives that kind of speaks to that. We're not sure if it was sent, but there is a letter that was written from Sarah to her technician employees about 1875, 76. I don't have the date in front of me, but it's when things were getting really, really bad. And it said, we're in trouble. Business is down. I've got to cut costs. I don't want to fire anybody. Can you discuss among yourselves what you would be willing to take on as maybe a pay cut or reduced hours and let me know. And that's, it's a remark. Now, again, I don't know if it was sent. Uh, There's some indication it wasn't. It may have just been a draft. But the fact that she was even contemplating sending something like that to, to the people, and she would obviously discuss it with them. I'm not sure our sort of stereotypical captain of industry would take that approach. Sarah and Mariah both did so much to demonstrate the abilities and potential of women. It's now been more than a century since both women have died. Where are we today? You know, I often think about what Mariah would think about the place of women right now and the struggles that women still encounter, the inequities that exist not just for women, but for people of all backgrounds. And I think she would be shocked. I think she'd be pleased that where things were better, but I think she'd be shocked that it wasn't everyone on the same equal footing platform, I think she would be disappointed. We recorded this conversation with Jason right before the annual Women of Science Symposium, which this year was being held virtually and free of charge. Jason said these conferences have been a refreshing opportunity for women in STEM. I graduated from a woman's college. So to me, being educated among a group of women was not, and being in large groups of women is not unusual. And also kind of growing up within the Mariah Mitchell Association, because I've been here for almost four years, I was surrounded by women. There were men who worked here too, but there was, it was heavily women who are kind of the department heads and what have you. The first in-person symposium we had to celebrate Mariah's 200th birthday in 2018 to have all these attendees come up to you and go, I've never been at a science-based conference with all women. 
there was a handful of men there and I applaud them for being there. I think that because it, there it's, it's open to everyone, men and women, people of all backgrounds. But to me, walking around the conference center and just seeing all women didn't even occur to me, you know, but to have all these women who I would say, you know, 90% of them had always, you know, when they go to conferences, even if they went to a women's college, they had never been in a situation in which they're having these discussions and there's, it's all women. For a lot of them, it was very empowering. And I think Mariah had that growing up on Nantucket with that unique community and then had it again when she was at Vassar, which was different, not different for her because she was kind of used to it already, but it was different for her students. And it was different, definitely different for the parents of her students who were not really keen on sending their child away to school where they couldn't control them. For all the progress that's been made, social norms die hard. And that is apparent in the scholarship applications students send in requesting to attend the Women of Science Symposium. Some of the things that the students, current students now who apply for scholarships to come, the things that they talk about are just, they, it breaks your heart to read some of the ways that they've been, you know, their family has felt about them being in, in the sciences or your STEM or the way they've been treated in, you know, high school and college and and that's why so many women fall out of STEM. With COVID and everything, it really got even worse. It's just frustrating. And I think Mariah would be really frustrated to, to read those same things, what they're facing and what they continue to face. If Mariah Mitchell was at your conference, mm -hmm. what would you like her to talk about? I obviously want her to address everybody, but I want in part to focus on the, the younger women in the room. And just to purely talk about her experience, what it was, what it's like, what it was like, how things might or might not have approved throughout her time, how she accomplished the things that she accomplished being a woman in those situations, and to relate that to them so they could understand. Because I think sometimes when you're in a situation, you don't understand that people have had that experience already. You think you're the only person who was X, Y, or Z. You're the only person who was harassed. You're the only person who was mistreated because you were a woman and you're only only woman in your master's program at, at this large university. And there's like 40 men and you're the only woman. I would like her to talk about what it was like and how she dealt with it, moved through it, accepted it or didn't accept it to try and inspire the people in the room, no matter the age, that idea that I said of putting your hand back and helping those behind you who need the help to come up because somebody helped you, you for the most part. I mean, there's a few who'd, who'd get there by their own volition. Somebody helped you. Somebody, at least one person cut through some of the tape ahead of you to make a pathway. It might've been a maze, but they cut some of it. So they made the maze maybe a little bit easier because I think that's what's important to remember where you came from and what you where you've gone and where you're going, even if it's just a few words, to show them that they're not alone and there is a path forward. This is the final episode in this season, but keep an eye on your feed for bonus episodes. And let us know what you think, what we might have gotten wrong, and what more you would like to know about the Bonds and the Mitchells. You can email me at jforest at nantucketathenam.org or leave a message for us in the comments. This has been a production of the Nantucket Athenaeum. It was written, edited, and narrated by me, Janet Forrest. Special thanks to the Athenaeum's Reference Library Associate, Jim Borzilleri, and Historian and Deputy Director of the Mariah Mitchell Association, Jason Leonardo Finger for their research and insights. Please check the show notes for more information and sources on the research. If you enjoyed this podcast episode, please rate, review, and subscribe. It helps others find the show. If you really enjoyed it, please share it with a friend or a colleague. The Nantucket Athenaeum is located at 1 India Street in Nantucket, Massachusetts. We would love for you to stop by. You can visit us online at nantucketathenaeum.org.